Samuel Beckett's uh, Waiting for Gatto premiered on January the 3rd, 1953, at a very small theater in Paris uh, called the Théâtre du Babylon. According to Beckett's biographer, uh, James Nolson, the play became a hit only after and because it upset many among its first audiences. At the Paris premiere, a group of well-dressed hecklers forced the curtain to come down after Lucky's monologue, and the play was put on hold for that performance. At the London premiere, two years later, a spectator shouted out in the middle of the play, this is why we lost the colonies. <laughs> when Estragon, at the same performance in London, asked Vladimir uh, if he has any rope with which they could hang themselves, somebody in the audience yelled, for God's sakes, give him some. <laughs> at the uh, opening night of the American premiere, which was of all places in Miami, uh, much of the audience simply left at the intermission. So let's jump ahead um, and to a very different kind of audience for the play. This is the 19th of November, 1957. This is a story told by Martin Eslin in his book, The Theater of the Absurd. So a small group of very worried actors 19th of November, 1957, are waiting behind a curtain in the dining hall at San Quentin Penitentiary in California. They are about to perform the first live play at San Quentin in over 40 years. And it is Waiting for Gatto. They chose it uh, mostly because it did not require women actors, the difficulty of using women actors inside a maximum security prison. So the curtain is about to rise on an audience that is made up of 1,400 of the toughest men on the planet. And a young San Francisco theater group is going to perform a highly obscure, avant-garde French play in which absolutely nothing happens. A play that, when it premiered in, for sophisticated theater audiences, angered and upset them. The director, Herbert Blau, decides that he will try to prepare his audience a bit for what's coming, the prisoners. So he steps from behind the curtain and he tells them, look, what you're about to see is a bit like jazz. Just listen and take from it whatever you can. The curtain parts, the play starts, and according to several witnesses who were there, and I've written about it, 1,400 hardened convicts are riveted in their seats. And they remain that way throughout the performance of the play. They get it instantly. What had bewildered and angered sophisticated theater audiences made immediate sense to an audience of convicts at a maximum security prison. Why? Why did the prisoners at San Quentin Penitentiary immediately grasp waiting for Gatto? Well, one answer. Perhaps it was because the prisoners saw themselves in this play, that these are men who knew what it meant to wait, who knew what it meant to be deprived of everything but waiting. That's possible. But my guess is you could have shown these prisoners a play about waiting that would have started a real riot, not a theater riot, a prison riot. I think the main reason that those prisoners identified with this play and why they themselves started the theater troupe afterwards to perform Beckett's plays in the prisons is that Beckett's plays are utterly and completely without pretense. Samuel Beckett did not have, for all of his reputation as an avant-garde playwright, simply did not have a pretentious bone in his body. And he doesn't have a pretentious word anywhere in his writings. It pains me to say this, more than you will know, but that is simply not true of T.S. Eliot or Virginia Woolf. 
Imagine reading The Wasteland to those prisoners at San Quentin. Imagine reading to the lighthouse to those prisoners. One of Beckett's early characters asks himself this question. Was it to be laughter or tears? It came to the same thing in the end. What I think that means is this, that what laughter and tears have in common is that they dissolve pretense. They cut through poses. Laughter and tears force us to take off whatever mask it is that we happen to be wearing. And they leave us exposed. You're laughing or you're crying, if only for a moment. Getting to that moment when the masks are off, when everything has been revealed, if only for a moment, is what drove Samuel Beckett as an artist. He was repeatedly attracted to characters who have been stripped of pretense by age or by circumstance. If I have my youth or my health or an important job or just a nice car, it's a lot easier for me to forget that I'm going to die that I was born, like all of you, with my mother straddling the grave in Samuel Beckett's unforgettable image. But if I've lost all of that, if I'm homeless, or I'm sick, or I'm old, then very little else is likely to matter to me other than the fact of my mortality. I am unlikely to worry too much about dying Fisher Kings if I'm starving. It's the same tactic that was used in film by one of Beckett's loves, and that's Charlie Chaplin. Use the tramp, use the, the man stripped of everything to go beneath pose to essence, to get to the core of being, to a point where the least pretentious, the least false is the most true. Strip everything away from a man. What's left is the truth. Because they wrote without pretense, in an unpretentious language, Chaplin and Beckett spoke about as close to a universal language as it is possible for art to get. It's language that is utterly and completely stripped of ornament. That's why in the 1930s, Charlie Chaplin was the most famous man in the world. Uh, at his 1931 meeting with Gandhi, the crowds were Beatles-sized, and they're screaming for Charlie, not for Gandhi. It's why the little tramp is still the most recognized fictional character in the world. He doesn't even need language. And that's why Beckett became a celebrity in the 1950s, and why even today, Beckett has more fan sites on the internet than any of the authors we are looking at in this series. Almost all of them run by amateurs, not by professional critics, real fans. One of them to which I would direct your attention, just Google Waiting for Godot and Guinea Pigs. Waiting for Godot and Guinea Pigs. It's a performance of Waiting for Godot by Guinea Pigs. <laughs> Waiting for Godot is the most clear, the most truthful play that I know. The question is not why the prisoners at San Quentin saw that, or something like it. The question is why sophisticated theater audiences, people who would go to see a new play, an avant-garde play at a very small theater by a then largely unknown writer, did not see that. Well, for Martin Eslin, the likely answer is their sophistication. That is that unlike those prisoners, the first sophisticated, educated audiences of Gatto came to it loaded with expectations about what a play should be and do. Waiting for Gatto upset those expectations and so therefore upset those audiences. To an educated audience, the shock of this play isn't so much that it broke with dramatic conventions. 
It's more that it threw those conventions in its audience's well-educated faces. For instance, Waiting for Godot actually follows all three of the so-called classical unities, the three unities for the stage that exist in very fragmented form in Aristotle's poetics and were turned into rules for the theater much later. The play follows, it uses plausibly connected actions. Each action is connected to the other, the unity of action. It takes place in a concentrated period of time. Aristotle had said merely in passing that a p action in a play should attempt to confine itself to a single daylight period. That became the rule of the unity of time, which the play follows. It takes place in a single setting, unity of place. But even though the play follows those classical unities, it follows the rules only to flout the very spirit of the rules. Traditional drama represents action. It's what Aristotle said drama is. It is the representation of an action. Gatto is about inaction. It's about waiting for an action that never happens. Probably the most quoted line about this play from an early Irish reviewer. Beckett has written a play in which nothing happens twice. <laughs> Time in this play is not so much concentrated the way the unities urge as it is undifferentiated. In this play, one moment is no different from the next. It's all the same suffering. It takes place in a single setting, but it is a setting that is almost completely removed from the real world. It's a place that is nowhere and everywhere at the same time. So, Waiting for Gatto follows the unity of action in a play without action. It follows the unity of time in a play without time. And it follows the unity of place in a play that is no place. Into the Lighthouse, we still had the bones of plot, right? The West's ancient faith that plots, like problems, have resolutions. That fathers will say, well done, to their sons. In Waiting for Gatto, the play ends exactly as it began. Both at the first and the second act end exactly the same way. They end with the words, yes, let's go. And the stage direction, they do not move. Both acts. Time has passed. That is what Beckett said he meant by the appearance of a few leaves on the tree in between the acts. But unlike in Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, the passage of time does not bring any kind of resolution, any kind of vision, the vision that we get in Lily's painting, for instance. There's no da, there's no answer no deeper resolution for the characters or for us. The last page of the play, my favorite lines in the play, Estragon, I can't go on like this. Vladimir, that's what you think. But the thing is this, Gatto, the play, did not upset traditional drama so much as it just picked at its scabs. This was hardly the first play that educated theater audiences would have seen to subvert the classical unities. It was not even close to the first play that they could have seen that would use dialogue that is punctuated by repetition and by silences. They could have learned all that from Chekhov, among others. There are some obvious causes for the hostility of the play's first audiences, things that probably should not be discounted. It's vulgarity. It's repetition. Specific circumstances in the different premiere. At the Paris premiere, the actor who played Lucky modeled Lucky after a patient of a friend of his who had Parkinson's disease. And apparently it was a very horrifying performance. That may be part of it. 
In Miami, the play was rather mistakenly billed as the last sensation of two continents. So audiences didn't get what they expected. So there may well be specific reasons for these things. But I think what really confused and angered educated audiences about Waiting for Godot is its neglect of long-standing and deeply important hierarchies between dramatic audiences and their characters. This is a play that was and is billed on the title page as a tragicomedy. And tragicomedy is pretty much like what it sounds, a hybrid of tragedy and comedy. Comedy traditionally relies on its audience's superiority to its characters, right? Our laughter from above at all of their silly mistakes, the hierarchy of comedy. Tragedy is schizophrenic because on the one hand, tragedy demands an audience that is inferior to its hero. The hero of tragedy is the best of his kind, a king. The higher they come, the harder they fall. So on the one hand, they are above us. But the audience of tragedy is also superior to the hero in one very crucial respect. And that is that we know something he does not. We know the downfall that is going to come. I, Oedipus, whom all men call great. Well, when the first audience of that play, when every audience of that play hears those words, they know what Oedipus does not know. Those lines are deeply ironic because we know more than Oedipus does. We know what's coming, and that's called dramatic irony. Waiting for Gatto refuses to play by the rules of either of its generic parents. If you feel comedy's superiority to Gogo and Didi, you have seriously misunderstood the play, and probably yourself. None of these characters come across as superior to us, and certainly not as the best of their kind. And most important of all, we do not get to watch these characters make their mistakes from above them, secure in the knowledge that we know more than they do, because we don't. There's no dramatic irony in this play, no superior knowledge for us as audience. Now, for an educated theater goer, it is perfectly OK for Oedipus, the tragic character, not to see what is going on, not to know. It's OK that Oedipus can't see or doesn't know that he murdered his father, that it's him who slept with his mother. But the audience has to know that in tragedy themselves. The reason that we have to know more than the hero does is to allow us to experience the cruel pleasure of dramatic irony the certain knowledge that you are doomed, and I know it, but you don't. That's the pleasure of tragedy, and it's a cruel pleasure, as Nietzsche, among others, have pointed out. In Waiting for Gatto, they did not get that. They did not get to feel superior to its characters. And that, more than anything else, is, I suspect, what upset those first educated audiences of the play, being forced to remain in uncertainty with no better understanding of life than that's how it is on this bitch of an earth. Pozo's line. The convicts at San Quentin, on the other hand, were clearly comfortable with that. Maybe because they had daily evidence that Pozo was right, that that is indeed how it is on this bitch of an earth. Maybe because they did not feel that they needed to know more about life than a couple of tramps. Samuel Beckett uh, was born in Dublin, Ireland, um, into a middle-class Protestant family. In 1928, at the age of 22, he moved to Paris, 
uh, to take a teaching job. And he became close friends with James Joyce, another Irish expatriate in Paris at the time. In the late 1920s and 30s, uh, he started writing. His first separately published work was actually a parody of The Wasteland, um, a long poem about Descartes, complete with footnotes. He wrote an essay on James Joyce's Ulysses. He wrote a book of short stories that was not published until many years later. His first published novel came out in 1938. It was called Murphy. He started to make his name in literary circles with Murphy. But the following year, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and all of that changed. Beckett joined the French resistance. Uh, his cell was betrayed to the Nazis, and he fled Paris for the south of France, where he worked as a farmhand and completed another novel. After the war, Beckett uh, volunteered in a Red Cross hospital in the south of France as an interpreter. Imagine the stories he must have heard. A, a great deal of this play probably reflects uh, post-war rationing in Paris. The exchange is about carrots and radishes, often all there was to eat in post-war Paris. Always being cold, there's no heat. Beckett and Suzanne, the woman that became his wife, in the apartment they lived in in Paris after the war, it had no heat, so they built a tent in the living room, and they would wear all their clothes inside the tent while they were writing. Their clothes are constantly worn out. It's post-war Paris. Partly under the influence of Joyce, um, Beckett had begun writing with the sense that writers of his time had to find new forms and a new language for a new world. That the world had changed, as it had for Eliot, and art had to keep up. After the war, finding a way to break with literary tradition began to seem even more necessary to Beckett. Now Joyce, as you'll know, solved this problem by inventing his own language. Beckett's solution was in a way even more radical and just as brilliant. He switched languages. After the war, he wrote in French. It's partly circumstance. Uh, the woman that he hid with in southern France, Suzanne, who later became his wife, did not speak a great deal of English. But Beckett himself said that abandoning the language of English literature freed him from the necessity of style. It allowed him to give up excess, color, style, all the baggage of the English literary style. What it did, I think, was it freed him from the weight of literary history. His decision to write in French is a kind of willed amnesia that allowed him to simply start over again, to start literary history at zero with Beckett. After the war, he wrote several novels and his most famous play, En Attendant Godot, which he translated into English himself as Waiting for Godot. The play made him famous. Uh, he became the name in dramatic and literary circles, especially but not only in Paris. He won the Nobel Prize in 1969, refused to attend the ceremony, and gave away the prize money to charity and to friends. This is my favorite photograph of Beckett. He died in 1989. So Beckett consciously set about forgetting the past by writing in a foreign language. In the play, that amnesia seems something that has happened to his characters rather than something they chose to do. Estragon cannot remember from day to day if they've been here before, if they've met each other before, if Gatto has come or not. And Vladimir's memory is not much better. It is a condition that afflicts everybody in the play. When Pozo returns in Act Two, he doesn't remember meeting Vladimir and Estragon. When the boy returns a little later, he doesn't remember Vladimir. 
They can't even remember each other's names. Page 19. Estragon speaks to Pozo. You're not Mr. Gatto, sir? Pozo. I am Pozo. Pozo. Does that name mean nothing to you? I say, does that name mean nothing to you? Bozo? Bozo? Pozo? Pozo? Pozo! Ah, Pozo. Let me see. Pozo. Is it Pozo or Bozo? I once knew a family called Gozo. The mother had the clap. <laughs> the memory loss here is more than just theirs. It's cultural amnesia. It's not just personal or individual. This is something that has happened to this world, this society. Early in the play, Vladimir says, hope deferred maketh the something sick. Who said that? Well, it's from Proverbs. That he couldn't remember that is itself not terribly surprising. But a few moments later, Vladimir says to Estragon, did you ever read the Bible? Estragon, the Bible. I must have taken a look at it. Now, you don't re forget reading the Bible. You've either read it or you've not. He can't even remember this book, not what is in it. It's similar in a way to the wasteland, where literature and myth have been emptied of meaning, where Shakespeare has become just a fragment in a pop song. But it's more than that here, because the Bible is not just in fragments, it's been forgotten almost entirely. And it's not just religion that they have forgotten. It's all of it, the entire Western inheritance, culture, nature, beauty. Page 38. This is Pozo. He's explaining the twilight. Ah, yes, the night. But be a little more attentive for pity's sake, otherwise we'll never get anywhere. Look. Will you look at the sky, pig, to Lucky? Good, that's enough. What is there so extraordinary about it? Qua sky. It is pale and luminous like any other sky at this hour of the day, in these latitudes, when the weather is fine. An hour ago, roughly, after having poured forth, even since, say, 10 o'clock in the morning, tirelessly torrents of red and white light, it begins to lose its effulgence, to grow pale, pale, ever a little paler, a little paler until, pff, finished. It comes to rest. But, but behind this veil of gentleness and peace, night is charging and will burst upon us like that, just when we least expect it. That's how it is on this bitch of an earth. Western art loves the sunset. It has always loved the sunset, this time of day. Think of the thousands of poems, the thousands of paintings, the movies that end with sunsets. It's a time of peace, a time of beauty and stillness. The sunset appeals to art because it is a moment in between times, the twilight. Here, it's just an opportunity for a performance. It's something to pass the time. Pozo says, after all of this, he says to Vladimir and Estragon, how did you find me? It's a performance. The beauty is gone, the meaning forgotten. Any attempt at meaningful speech in Waiting for Gatto is broken, fragmented. It's more pauses than words. Again, it's a bit like Eliot's world. Recall Prufrock's complaint that it is impossible to say just what I mean. But it's much more than that here. It almost seems painful for Beckett's characters to articulate what they're thinking, to speak. They stutter, they sigh, they lapse into silence. In the absence of any kind of meaningful speech, they opt instead for nonsense speech. Page 84. Vladimir speaking to break the silence. Do you, oh pardon, carry on. No, no, after you. No, no, you first. I interrupted you, on the contrary. Ceremonious ape, punctilious pig, finish your phrase, I tell you, finish your own. 
moron. That's the idea. Let's abuse each other. Moron, vermin, abortion, morpian, sewer rat, curate, cretin, critic. Oh. Now let's make it up. Go, go. Dee Dee, your hand, take it. Come to my arms, your arms, my breast. Off we go. How time flies when one has fun. <laughs> they play games to fill up the time. They speak like this, as Vladimir says, so we won't think. Speak to avoid thinking. Words fill up the silence. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, using chatter to fill up the dreadful silence. And that might be partly why Beckett himself moved increasingly towards an art without words. One of his later plays is called Breath, uh, 1970. The lights come up on a stage that is strewn with garbage. The audience hears a cry and then an inhale. Then they hear an exhale and another cry. And the lights go out. And that's it. An entire human life in 40 seconds. That's how long it takes to stage breath. It's a cheap play for the actors. <laughs> even if words don't work, even if language does not work in this play, the characters in Waiting for Gatto still long to hear the word. They're still waiting for Gatto, despite everything. They're staying and they're waiting for him, still hoping that something, anything at all, will happen to pass the time. Page 12, Act 1. Vladimir, what do we do now? Astragon, wait. Yes, but while waiting. What about hanging ourselves? Hmm, it'd give us an erection. An erection with all that follows. Where it falls, mandrakes grow. That's why they shriek when you pull them up. Did you not know that? Let's hang ourselves immediately. It's the same reason he suggests committing suicide merely to pass the time. And it's the same reason, I think, that Vladimir keeps looking inside his hat. There's never been anything in there before, but who knows, maybe this time there will be something in there. It's the reason that they so want Lucky to speak, to pass the time, but also on the off chance that something meaningful will come out of Lucky's mouth. But when Lucky does speak in his famous and terribly difficult to perform monologue, all that comes out is gibberish. It's half forgotten scholarship, fragments of pseudo knowledge, all of which adds up to absolutely nothing. Lucky's speech is a great deal like the factory scene, the factory in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Time. That, that factory in modern times is tremendously busy. Everybody's busy making something, but nobody watching the film has any idea what the factory actually makes, what the product is. It's just noise and machines moving without producing anything. Mostly, what Vladimir and Astron are waiting for is Gatto. Who is Gatto? Well, he's the person that Vladimir and Astron are waiting for. After Beckett won the Nobel Prize, he got a postcard from a Monsieur Georges Gatto in Paris. And he wrote Beckett to say how sorry he was that he'd kept him waiting all these years. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, the director of the first American performance of the play asked Beckett who or what Gatto meant, Beckett said, if I knew, I would have said so in the play. <laughs> now, for a great number of readers um, and audience members, Gatto is God. And the fact that he never shows up is a comment on the disappearance of God and religion from the post-war world. 
For one of the prisoners at San Quentin, Gatto was society. For another one of the prisoners, Gatto was the outside world. I think Gatto is a, a general symbol in the sense that Virginia Woolf's lighthouse is a general symbol. That is, it does not have a particular symbolic referent. It means different things to different people. To me, what Gatto means is any belief system that promises a complete explanation. God, yes, but also Da. Also the sacred scriptures that Lily believes are inside Mrs. Ramsey. Also science. Anything at all that promises a complete explanation or answer to life. That's what we're waiting for. What really matters, though, in this play, I think, is not who or what Gatto is. It's the fact that we're all waiting for Gatto. You see, action helps us to ignore time. It's easier to ignore the passage of time if you're busy, if you're pushed about by causality. Waiting forces us, characters and audience, to confront time, to be aware of its passage, to remember, as the play forces you to, that we are all born with our mothers astride the grave. Now, we tend to forget this, because the secret to life is just to keep on going, just to keep on doing what we do, out of habit, if nothing else. Page 104. Vladimir. A stride of a grave and a difficult birth. Down in the hole, lingeringly, the gravedigger puts on the forceps. We have time to grow old. The air is full of our cries, but habit is a great deadener. So Beckett himself said much earlier in a book that he wrote on Marcel Proust, 1931, habit is the ballast that chains the dog to his vomit. Lovely image. Breathing is habit. Life is habit. Rarely does one experience the moment when the boredom of living is replaced by the suffering of being. That is what Samuel Beckett is aiming at. Always dim at, did aim at. Not the dramatization of action, of all the things that we do out of habit, but the dramatization of a condition, the suffering of being. That suffering is one reason why this is quite often called an existentialist play. It says so on the back of the Grove edition, that this is an existentialist play. I don't think so. At heart, I do not think this is an existentialist play at all. The basic principle of existentialist ethics is that we are what we make of ourselves. In Jean-Paul Sartre's famous phrase, existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. What is meant here by saying that existence precedes essence? It means that, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and only afterwards defines himself. Thus, there is no human nature, since there is no God to conceive it. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. Such is the first principle of existentialism. But if existence really does precede essence, man is responsible for what he is. What Sartre means is that the only person who is responsible for your actions, for the life that you make, is you. There is no predetermined path. There's no such thing as human nature. And that is what existentialist angst is. The realization that you are completely on your own. 
and that there is no one else, no God, but nothing else either, to whom you can defer meaning and responsibility for your actions. Waiting for Gatto shares that existential angst. There is no superior knowledge for the characters. No God for us or the characters. No answers. It's not just that Gatto never speaks, never gives an answer like da or well done. Gatto never even shows up. So waiting for Godot represents something that is very close to the existential spirit, the existential condition, which is hardly surprising since they both grew out of the same soil, and that is occupied France. But the play is not existentialist, if you see the difference, because it does not share the hope that Sartre found in the wreckage. And that is humanity's radical freedom to find our own answers, to create our own essences, to make ourselves. Early in the play, Vladimir tells Astragon a story from the Bible, a story from the Gospel of Luke, a story about the two thieves. Vladimir, two thieves crucified at the same time as our Savior. One, our what? Our Savior. Two thieves. One is supposed to have been saved and the other damned. Saved from what? Hell, I'm going. He does not move. And yet, how is it, this is not boring you, I hope, how is it that of the four evangelists, only one speaks of a thief being saved? The four of them were there, or thereabouts, and only one speaks of a thief being saved. Come on, go, go, return the ball, can't you, once in a way? I find this really most extraordinarily interesting. Estragon comes back a few moments later. Look, the evangelists don't agree, and that's all there is to it. Vladimir, but all four were there, and only one speaks of a thief being saved. Why believe him rather than the others? Estragon, who believes him? <laughs> Vladimir, everybody. It's the only version they know. Estragon, people are bloody ignorant apes. Three different takes on this story, okay? The classic Christian interpretation of the story that you just heard in fragments is by St. Augustine. St. Augustine says that the story of the thieves means this. Do not despair. One of the thieves was saved. Do not presume one of the thieves was damned. That's the lesson. For Augustine, this story is a lesson in the wonder and the uncertainty of grace, the gift of God's love, that you cannot presume, but you also do not need to despair. To an existentialist like Sartre, that is nonsense. This thief chose to be a thief, and that's why he's hanging up there on the cross. Most important to an existentialist, there is no mysterious force like grace deciding in advance our essence deciding that some of us are saved and some of us are damned. Now, what does the story mean to Gogo and Didi? Not much. It is just another story to pass the time. Estragon barely cares enough to listen, and Vladimir is more interested in why only one of the four apostles tells the story than in why one thief was saved and the other was damned. The story simply has no relevance to their lives. Vladimir even has to struggle to remember what the opposite of saved is. He can't remember what damned is. Estragon and Vladimir do not have St. Augustine's faith that there is a meaning behind the apparently random events of life. But they also, and crucially, do not share Sartre's conviction that they can themselves decide that meaning. So all they do is suffer and play games to fill up the void. Waiting for Gatto 
does not show humans controlling time, freely shaping their own destiny, the way an existentialist should. It shows humans enduring time, what we're, life, what we're like, I should say, when we've got nothing left but time, which is to say, all the time. I can't go on like this, says Estragon. That's what you think, says Vladimir. That is what Theodore Adorno said was the only consolation in Beckett's plays, the only fragment of hope that is left in these plays. Stoicism, toughness, survival. I can't go on like this. That's what you think. Yes, you can. Beginning with Martin Eslin, a very long line, <clears throat> excuse me, of critics and classroom teachers have attempted to defuse Vladimir's bombshell by saying that he and Estragon are not good existentialists. That is, that this is a critique of them, that Vladimir and Estragon are avoiding both the possibility and the responsibility of their freedom. In Sartre's terms, they are behaving in bad faith. But the problem with reading Waiting for Godot as a criticism of its characters, existentialist or otherwise, is that it makes us, the audience, superior to those characters. It makes the play depend on not only what it does not have, but what it doggedly and determinately rejects. And that's dramatic irony. The giving of more knowledge to us than the characters inside the play. If the play did endorse existentialism, if it was, as it is repeatedly claimed to be, an existentialist play, that would mean that one religion, one explanation has survived. And the play is about the loss of all explanations all answers, including existentialism. Not just the outdated answers, but also the fashionable answers. That's what I meant by Beckett being utterly without pretense, that he could turn his back on the fashionable as well as the dated. Waiting for Godot is not about Godot. It's about waiting. The first word is the word that matters. It's not about answers. It's about enduring without answers. I can't go on like this. That's what you think. These are the last words that Beckett ever wrote from the stage, um, from a play called What, Where, 1983. Time passes. That is all. Make sense who may. I switch off. Thank you.